And uh, good afternoon to all of you. I hope you had a good break, maybe not dinner, lunch, wherever you are in the world. We move now to our next panel, and that is about global leaders and financial world. And the circular economy is certainly one of the most innovative economic activities in our world today. It addresses some crucial challenges. Many of the challenges of climate change, efficient use of resources, social development, energy transition, health, you name it. And this is why, it's because it encompasses all these issues, it makes it quite complex. A different model for processes and products and new businesses strategies. So no actor can succeed on its own, this huge change. And we saw it during this morning. But it seems obvious that collaboration between industry and financial world has the capacity to bring circular bioeconomy into reality. So that's what we want to bring out today. And I will start, we will start, we will have two panels, one on financial financing world and the other one on global leaders. So uh, we will start with the financing world and our keynote speaker is a very well-known and respected person in the financial world, not only in Brazil, but internationally as well. So I would like to introduce you and ask him to come on stage, Mr. Joaquim Vieira Ferreira Levy, who is the Director of Economic Strategy and Relations with Markets of Banco Safra in Brazil. Joaquim, please. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to be addressing you at this important forum for such an important um, topic, which is, as just mentioned, one of the most dynamic in the world, and that raises a number of questions, and it's crucial to Brazil, not only to the Amazon, but for the whole Brazilian economy. I have prepared a brief presentation uh, to address some of the most relevant topics in this huge landscape that will be addressed in the next uh, uh, panels. And um, I may ask um, whoever is in charge to uh, put the presentation um, so that um, we, we can uh, go over that. I, I think that might be easier perhaps if I speak uh, in, in Portuguese, that would be fine. Uh, ok, então eu vou falar em português, que eu imagino que tem a tradução. Very well, so I will speak Portuguese because I know there is translation, so it's easier for me. Very well. The discussion of bioeconomy is extremely important. This is why we're gathered here. Also, the climate discussions are very important. These are extremely relevant topics for the Brazilian economy, which is very much based on activities which, after all, have to do with biology, beginning with agriculture, and one of the main activities we have. So when we try to adopt a financial angle, then the main thing is to understand that we need to identify and recognize and make others recognize benefits in such a way as to uh, price them. We may not like the fact that there is a price to that, but this is what a world economy is like. So benefits begin with climate benefits. There are several other environmental services, beginning with biodiversity, which for the Amazon it is fundamental, since this is 
the region with most of biodiversity on the planet. Besides that, we have other essential benefits. We can design a bioeconomy to be inclusive, allowing for good standard of living for the families of small producers. I had several opportunities to visit regions in uh, Auto Xingu and other parts, and we can see that small producers may have adequate remuneration. And it is important for them to raise a family with education, health, and well being. And finally, there are benefits for health also coming from uh, bioeconomy. There are always less uh, polluting alternatives, and all of this is very important for human health. So in bioeconomy, we have a contribution that is global, it is social, and it is also individual. These benefits need to be identified, known, measured, because with adequate approach, you will be able to obtain financing, either financing aiming at profit and financing for other purposes. What's very important in bioeconomy, especially in the case of Brazil, is that it brings very important solutions to pressing problems. For It brings immediate solutions, not for the future. All of us, of course, are interested in the development of new technologies and uh, the development of companies and of uh, production means. All of this needs to happen, but it will take time. So a molecule of carbon gas that is not in the air because its emission was uh, prevented or because it was uh, captured, it is worth more now than it was worth in the future. And I draw attention to that because the issue of forests, uh, the forests uh, are a weak carbon sink, which is not permanent and therefore it wouldn't be uh, valuable. So Brazil needs to understand and explain to others that what you avoid today, what you absorb today is of value, even if you cannot maintain that in the future. These effects are dilated in time. So uh, what is being absorbed uh, from the atmosphere today will present benefits in 2050, for instance. Now, with bioeconomy, I can make it easier for biotechnologies to have an effect 20 or 30 years from now. This is because the definition of benefit is very important for the pricing and for financing. So even if you absorb uh, carbon in a forest for one or two five years, but if you even if you cannot promise to continue to capture uh, carbon 50 years from now, this postponement of uh, carbon is valuable as well. This is uh, debated nowadays, but this topic is of fundamental interest to Brazil, and we have to develop technologies and methodologies to uh, price all this. Another important aspect in bioeconomy, I took three aspects to simplify things. The first part has to do with biofuel. We have no sound coming from the speaker. There's no sound coming from the speaker. No sound anymore. No sound. 
We don't hear the speaker. I'll resume translation when uh, we uh, hear the speaker again. The speaker seems to be muted. The speaker seems to be still mute. We shall resume translation of whenever the sound comes back. Sorry about that. Yes, we're back. How can we price then bioactivities and the bioeconomy? What is the definition of baseline, for instance? If I uh, price livestock, how will I verify the value of that? Uh, how much carbon is involved? Is it renewed every year or not? These are essential aspects for a bioeconomy to be able to take off. Uh, also, I also uh, assess the value of uh, plantations and I take the degraded uh, land and in a few years I will have better land with uh, deep roots and so on. Uh, how much value was generated by that if we measure the carbon in the soil? And this has to be done for this activity to be ad adequately priced and in order to promote, to produce a carbon credit and for me to attract financing for that. As I was saying, we already have some financing mechanisms, but we need to have the project. And for that, we need the methodologies to demonstrate the value of the projects, of the actions and of the alternatives we have. This is fundamental. And I think this is the main agenda we have uh, to talk about in Glasgow. The same thing applies to permanent cultures, cocoa and extraction crops. All of this needs to be uh, adequately dimensioned for us to obtain financial resources. As I said before, one way for us to price these benefits, one year after the other is by measuring emissions. And with that, I can uh, show that I didn't have a gain today for not having emitted pollution in the past. And I can measure what this means in terms of reducing environmental uh, risks. 
in the forest. I can measure that. There can be pools, but for many mechanisms, this measurement is important. And the definition also of the exact en environmental benefit is important because we may also have tax benefits. If I apply for a tax benefit, I have to demonstrate what uh, environmental benefit I am producing. We uh, recently adopted a law on uh, environmental benefits, provided benefits can be measured and proven. This allows us to integrate with regular markets as well. As I said before, we have had some innovation, especially here in Brazil, in the various tools. For instance, there can be green rural producers. And what does this mean? How can it work? You may have a, a structurer, someone who will produce something in a different manner and possibly generate carbon credits. And the intermediary will have a gain with the uh, carbon credit, and this will not be taxed by the income tax. He will then uh, have to find an end buyer for the carbon credit. All of this needs to be adequately followed in order to ensure the integrity of uh, what is happening in the economic activity and in the credit that is created. We also have FIAGRO. It can be green as well. It is a fund for investing in agriculture and it has uh, equity characteristics. This is like long-term investment and this will price the valuation of land where you can have uh, sustainable activities which will remain val valid in the medium and long term and will also generate other benefits. This afternoon, I think many initiatives will be discussed that are not so much to do with investment, they are commercial. The ones I mentioned before are commercial, uh, but someone invests in them because there will be a return. Now, there is there are cases where the return will come to companies that are not part of the formal carbon market, but which are associated to projects that reduce uh, emissions or increase the capture of carbon in the atmosphere, and thus they are willing to invest, provided they know what the expected result is. I mentioned the uh, Eastern Amazon Fund. It, it's a fund created a while ago, and uh, they try to attract investment. And an important feature is jurisdictional actions. This means that instead of looking at a specific project, I am considering policies that allow for results compatible with the uh, sustainability goals that we have in order to stand up to the climate ch challenge. All of these aspects put together will help us to integrate the voluntary market and the regulated market, where it is very important for there to be room for compensation in such a way that you will be able to take funds from the regulated market to transfer them to uh, actions in bioeconomy. But this will only be possible if, as I said in the beginning, we have a good definition as to the benefits bioeconomy is bringing in, because then I can compensate with the degree of uh, integrity, additionality, the permanence or not of results, so as to allow me to establish trade of carbon certificates. And from then on, I will also be able to attract financing. One last feeling here is that 
there is a discussion now in Brazil about the two essential markets, the two essential aspects in the market. The, the framework uh, for the domestic carbon. Marcelo Ramos in the Amazon has uh, proposed some legislation. On the one hand, we have the uh, certification of activities so as to know the exact uh, contribution of certain activities. And on the other hand, you will have the market where you can have a compensation. And this is very important because many sectors in the economy will be able to transfer resources or funds to bioeconomy. As a benefit, there will be a reduction in uh, carbon emissions, not at $50 a ton, but maybe at 7 or $8 a ton. There are several studies that showing that you may have considerable reduction in emissions if this sort of trade happens within the regulated market, uh, carbon market. So I believe that we already have today financial tools and there is much demand by Brazilian companies and also by foreign companies. And it is very important for us to prepare in such a way that I mentioned here that eight in the uh, nine states in the Amazon region have applied for funds and they were granted. So to the extent that the legitimacy and the timeliness and the scope of solutions in bioeconomy are recognized to prevent climate or to mitigate my, uh, climate change, then I am sure we shall attract resources, we will find the financing to grow in these solutions. And together with other solutions in the field of uh, energy or power and other technologies, we can be a country that will not be pointed at as being the cause of uh, problems in climate change. But on the, on the contrary, we will be an important player in the discussion of the climate and we will possibly come first ahead of others to a point of uh, zero uh, net emissions. We uh, do not need to get there with capital intensive solutions that are not within the reach of people. On the contrary, there is an IBG document that will be made public this weekend showing that there are endless opportunities for bioeconomy. And I am sure that with good environmental services in bioeconomy and with adequate measurement, we shall attract financial or funds to finance these sectors with a very positive social impact for the transformation of the Amazon region and its population. Thank you very much. I am sure the discussion here will go deeper into these uh, matters and it will be as pleasant as one of these ice creams made with an Amazonian fruit. Thank you very much, Dr. Joaquin. This was a very interesting and very good lecture. Uh -huh. It's really important to recognize and monetize the benefits of the bioeconomy. And it's really about metrics. And I hope um, the next panel will talk a bit about met metrics. Now, 
I would like to introduce then the panel on sustainable financing. The panel will be moderated by Michael Nethersheim. He is the founding partner of the European Circular Bioeconomy Fund, o Fundo Europeu de Bioeconomia Circular, portanto um fundo privado, vai ser o nosso This is a private fund. He's going to be the moderator of the next panel. Hello, Michael. of uh, your guests and uh, please then present them. So we will have Gustavo Montesano, Mary Lista, Anna Young and Sergio Real. Hello, Michael, could you present them please? Yes. And then carry on. Thank you, So Olá, boa tarde a todos. Uh, cumprimento em português para uh. vou falar em inglês aqui em cordialidade aos nossos participantes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, although virtually, uh, debating the bio Tá bom. Uh, I would like to uh, inform the English audience that uh, I'm not translating. The English booth is not translating if it, because we have no sound again. If somebody could uh, advise the technical team. É o dia inteiro, Simone, desde as sete da manhã, assim. É. Eu fiquei tão cansada ontem que eu fui dormir, acho que oito e meia. Eu estava exausta. E o tempo inteiro esperando para ser chamada para fazer um teste, não chamaram nada. Innovation, policy design, and then policy implementation. 
and we focus on three objectives. One is how do we need to communicate with the solution. We take a long-term view, so we focus on protecting finance and safety and security. And thirdly, how do we find an optimal way to engage um, in the user so that we can mobilize the communication that way. Thank you, Anna. And um, not sure who wants to uh, say more on, on uh, the sustainable finance topic from, from his perspective. Uh, uh, Gustavo, um, do you have slides with you? Um, let's not sure whether that is the case. No, Michael, just, just uh, verbally, no mind. Okay, then I would uh, propose in order to really get into the discussion that we start with um, initial questions. And uh, maybe directly with you, um, Gustavo, if, if I may. If I may. So what does sustainable financing mean for, for you and for BNDEF? Yeah, I would say that uh, sustainable finance as of today, Michael, it's, in, it's within the core of uh, BNDES. And I would say that's within the core of uh, any development financial institution on global. Right? When we speak about uh, uh, finance infrastructure, finance uh, uh, improvements, and financial environment. In all those uh, 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 perspectives, sustainability is a key word. I would say that uh, any of the banks, Sergio speak about more, more, more of that for sure as of today, I have said the same. When you speak about innovation and sustainability, it's across the border topic for, for us. Right? And uh, getting deeper on the, on the, on the topic of bioeconomy and how the sustainable bioeconomy how do you see that at, at BNDS? Uh, we are able to create a long-standing st long, long understanding ab about the topic. BNDS has been playing in the field for almost 30 years. So a long-standing learning and, and a lot of experiences we had at the bank. And uh, I would like to summarize uh, the bioeconomy uh, financing as uh, in, a, in a few words, is reminding that uh, ecosystems they belong to economic systems, right? Uh, for, for some uh, time on the past, let's say, not so far distant fast, would like to love, would like to try it, to separate the ecosystems from the economic system. And uh, 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 they are kind of symbiotic. We need to plan to play both of them together and they are part of, uh, of, of each other. Would say that uh, biodiversity, it, 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 it gives us, give us human beings not only a resource or raw material or products, but also services. We need to, we need to recognize that uh, biodiversity is a product provider, physical products, but also a service provider. This uh, uh, dual uh, perspective is critical to value, understand, and monetize it, the, the, the biodiversity. If you take a global map of the world as of today, and in Brazil, it's not different. Uh, regions that are re very rich on biodiversity, usually, I would say most of the time, they are very poor when you go to social conditions, right? And that's the time we need, we need to, to, to change it back. The society we created uh, globally, uh, uh, where there is richness, there is pollution, and there is low biodiversity. So we need to send the right price signal to the last mile in order to uh, uh, promote what we call the forest entrepreneurs. We do think that uh, the solution and the main, the main hand that will turn this raw material, this resource or these services into true assets uh, are the entrepreneurs. And when we speak about uh, very far distance or uh, high biodiversity regions, uh, mobilizing capital is of course crucial, is very important, but more important than mobilizing capital on those regions is deploying the capital. The, the economic background, institutional background, log logistic challenges that we have on those very rich bio biodiversity regions, they are very, very different from the traditional economic, dy economic dy dynamics that you live and we see in the, in the urban areas. So as of today, in, in our agenda of BNDS, but again, not only BNDS, but I'll say DFIs or, or, or development banks across the globe, we have the taxonomy of biodiversity products 
and services as a, as a key cornerstone in, in our agenda. Having a proper global taxonomy that we can speak the same, the same language and then trade those services and trade those assets. Alongside with taxonomy is technology, providing creating proper technology uh, to those regions and to those realities and technology in the physical sense of the tech, tech sense by itself, but also financial technology. And speaking about financial technology, we do think that the very, step, the very first step to push and improve bioeconomy uh, clusters is by blended finance, not trying to separate philanthropy or grant capital from for-profit from, from for, for capital. We need to blend. And by blending, we are quite sure that we can increase the potential of this uh, grant or, or subsidized uh, 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 money and promote the, the, first, the first entrepreneurs so they can uh, produce and deliver to the world resources, raw material and services. Uh, thank you, Gustavo. And uh, great to see that you really have a holistic uh, view and also uh, you can zoom into um, different um, aspects and especially the biodiversity aspect, which I think is important for your region. Um, Anna, um, you work for, for Chatham House, a, a well-known and world-renowned think tank. What's your perspective on uh, sustainable financing and objectives that sustainable financing uh, should uh, achieve? Um, so we look at it from sort of four different, I actually had a slide, but I think probably we'll, we'll much better if I just talk through them. We can see four major trends uh, coming our way. And I can see a sort of convergence of these different trends that are shaping investor behavior. One uh, are investors looking at long-term investment strategy. The other group are impact investment. So we, see, do, we do see mainstream investors also setting up impact funds. There is this discussion around how to integrate ESG uh, into investment portfolio, and then there's climate finance. And ultimately, I do think that these different movements, we're all aiming towards a similar sort of approach, which is sort of how do we invest in the green and the fair uh, business approaches and uh, economic solutions. But I, sometimes I just feel like these are, um, they're a little bit siloed, they're not connected but we can see that they are really sort of creating a massive trend. So if we use the example of ESG, um, so in the last 12 months, according to a Bloomberg article uh, early this year, um, we are going, there was a growth of 15 trillion, and so it's projected to achieve by 2025 uh, about a fourth of the global asset under management. So the number they gave is 53 trillion ESG, Fund, uh, in the context of 140 trillion. So I think that's um, a good example of how ESG is mainstream. We're also seeing other activities uh, going on in the investor space, which is really, really interesting, around how do you redefine a fiduciary responsibility of um, shareholders and also board members, mm -hmm. um, movements around how do you enlarge uh, discussion and understandings of accounting practices, so whether it's normative accounting, so it's how do you account for changing social norm or natural capital accounting. Uh, we do see discussions um, on sort of the reporting, um, how do you incorporate climate uh, performance, but also the TNFT, which is how to incorporate nature-based uh, financial disclosures and reporting, and also different kind of green taxonomy. So we can see a lot of movement happening on the space. And I think the bigger, I think the biggest challenge is how do we completely integrate into investment approach so that it's not a tick, it's not a box ticking exercise, and it really redefined the fundamentals of investment decisions. And I think that's mm. still yet for us to sort of see. But I, I'm I'm very optimistic about some of the trends that we're seeing. Yes, I, I think I, I could not uh, agree more to, you, to your statements, and uh, um, I would also say um, ESG is becoming mainstream, which is really good, but it's also about implementation and, and getting, getting it uh, on the ground. Um, Mary, from, from your perspective as a um, player in a financial institution, how would you um, um, describe the criteria that are important um, 
for sustainable finance, especially you are very close to the forest sector, how, how would you um, define or describe the criteria that are really important for, for your activities? Yeah, if I may, maybe I can, I have a couple of slides which I think sort of well demonstrates um, our approach. So, uh, can you see? Not yet. Okay. Now, do you see that now? Yeah, okay. So I already explained who I see it. So let me, just before I get to uh, the specifics, I mean, IFC is the private sector arm, like I said. So we invest, we provide financing, but we also provide advice and we um, help mobilize additional financing because our sort of main goal is to crowd in the private sector, including we work alongside of BNDS and, and Santander and several of the banks active um, in Latin America. Um, so we we do incorporate, I mean, depending on what our clients' needs are, we can go, you know, forestry. The forestry sector is very long-term. So it requires long-term capital, long-term goals, long-term cooperation with all of the stakeholders, including governments, including local communities. Um, and um, so in addition to just providing financing, though, we, we do have in-house expertise and we, we work with our clients to help them better understand the sustainability angle and the importance of addressing climate change, um, offering services um, to them to, to cooperate and, and work more closely with uh, local communities um, to make sure their voices are heard and that any investment incorporates that and recognizes that um, you know, the stakeholders um, uh, in and around any given project and the government is also an, a, a crucial element. Um, so, our, our, the way we, we approach sustainability, both on the financial side, but really on the uh, environmental and social services side. So all of our projects must meet our, um, what we call our IFC environmental and social performance standards. A lot of uh, banks globally have adopted these. Um, and um, we like to think that they are really the sort of gold standard of how to approach from the ESG side, um, sustainable investments. Um, it includes looking at, um, uh, you know, make, ensuring that the labor force uh, is, is treated properly, that, it, that all of our investments promote uh, research efficiency and pollution control. Uh, we engage closely with local communities. Uh, we are very sensitive to uh, land title issues uh, and uh, biodiversity, ensuring that uh, any investment uh, ensures the integrity of the local biomes. Uh, we recognize the importance of indigenous peoples and cultural heritage. So this is how we mainly tackle sustainability. We have a, a, a number of um, uh, assessments that need to be made to ensure that any company we invest in um, meets our performance standards. Uh, and we view, we think this is, is good for a number of reasons, not just because we want to do the right thing, but we think it creates added value to our, to the private sector. Um, it protects the environment, it increases our impact, uh, and it enhances transparency, which I think is a key element um, that we need to work not only with the local communities, but the governments to ensure that the regulatory environment is conducive to attract private sector financing. Again, this is very long term. These tend to be very long term investments, which require uh, a, a large amount of, of capital. And, um, you know, one thing an investor doesn't like the most is uncertainty. So if he's sure that, you know, everyone and the market is, is playing by the same rules, um, then he can make his own decisions and, and ensure that, you know, not just he is focused on sustainability because there is a cost to that, but the cost to not uh, ensuring that um, our investments are, are conducted in a way that protects and, and uh, supports the environment and local communities is not doing that is, is even more costly. So maybe just a quick, a few words on, you know, getting down on the more micro level on, you know, what, what kind of 
products is the market offering. And this isn't just IFC, Santander is involved. I'm sure BNDS is doing these things as well. Um, but we can, in, to incentivize further a company, um, we can offer these loans that are linked to sustainable sustainability KPIs. And they can range from a number of things depending on the sector and the activities of the company. So we work with our clients to identify, um, and this is sort of beyond business as usual. We, we work with them to set targets beyond what maybe the investor down the road is doing, to push them further. Um, and provided that they meet those KPIs, there is now in within the market sort of financial incentives that, um, that where if the company meets its KPI, he can have a slight reduction in in the pricing of the loan. And other banks increasingly are, are recognizing this. So it, it, in the long run, it helps bring down the company's cost of doing business. And, and KPIs aren't just linked to sort of, you know, biodiversity. They can also be linked even in, within the forestry sector to things like blue loans, where, you know, the forestry, the beauty of the forestry sector is that it, it is more environmentally friendly, it's renewable, it's biodegradable, it can replace more uh, fossil fuel intensive industries, um, including things like plastics, which you know, are destroying the oceans. So we've, you know, we're even looking at providing a forestry company with what we call a blue loan because of the uh, product substitution that it can be in reducing plastics in the ocean. Yeah, thank you, Mary. That's really insightful how you uh, address uh, the sustainability uh, topic, especially, like you said, at the micro level. I think that's really interesting and, of course, addressing one of the big challenges, how to really make it happen finally. I think uh, paper is always patient. You could can put a lot of uh, thoughts onto this, but uh, the, finally it comes down to what can be implemented at the company level. But, of, of course, we are all investors uh, to a certain extent, and um, my question uh, for Sergio would be, um, how attractive is uh, sustainable financing these days? It has not been en vogue in the past uh, decades, but uh, as um, it was uh, already uh, mentioned, it becomes more mainstream ESG. So, um, Sergio, from your perspective, what are uh, the drivers from an economical point of view, and are there any drivers? I think the drivers are... Uh have come very strongly with the ESG agenda. So I think that's a fact. But what I would like to provoke, perhaps, as a thought is when, when we think about Brazil and when we think about, including myself as a financial leader and now representing today the two other financial institutions, and we look at our own scorecard as a financial industry, I don't think we can claim victory as far as having been active, uh, transformation agents of conservation and development. And let me give you some couple of facts. Uh, when you look at from a bioeconomy standpoint of view, we are talking about a number of cultures in the Amazon that converse well with the level of family and land structure that would be amenable to have the forest pretty much intact. And we're talking about Brazilian nuts, we're talking about acai has been mentioned. We're talking about cocoa. For example, in the case of nuts, Brazil's nuts, the largest exporter of those nuts are Bolivia, not Brazil. When you look at cocoa, Brazil can barely compete with Vietnam, which is one of the world's largest cocoa exporters. So, and when you look at degraded land, we have 90 million hectares degraded which can absolutely be reused if the financial industry puts its best brains and incentives in the right way. How can we continue to grow uh, on a sustainable basis Brazil's agriculture without in any form of shape touch the forest any further? Then there are a number of dilemmas, which is, I think Gustavo very wisely touched on it, which is, yes, we have over 5 million plant species in the Amazon, and, 20, and 25 million people living in the region, of which all of them have an average income 20% less than the national income. When we talk about, Mary very wisely mentioned about the indigenous populations, what have we learned 
from the indigenous population in a proactive and dynamic way to how to preserve and exploit the forest and the bioeconomy in a different format than I think we have learned from more the urban classic capital markets stance. Very little. So I think, I think there has to be also a sort of a soul search. And that's why we, the three largest private banks, together with BNDS and others, have basically come to the conclusion that if the Brazilian society doesn't understand the true value of preserving what is the world's 20% biodiversity base, we certainly, the world has a big problem. It's not going to be London, it's not going to be York, it's going to be those leaving the 220 million people. And for that, we have to come with practical solutions to those living in the region and access to money. And access to money that's affordable, point number one. Point number two, we need to go with inexpensive satellite communica communication satellites that can actually help those communities to be better connected. I mean, the beauty of the technology transformation is that certainly less expensive than it has been. We need to stimulate telecom companies to put fiber optics through the rivers. You know, one of our banks here, Bradesco, has a bank in a boat. That's the way for people to be able to withdraw cash if you're living on the shore of a river in the middle of the Amazon. I mean, there are no ATMs sitting in the rainforest. So those are some very practical, uh, I would say, steps that we have to scale them up so that we can absolutely have different levels of cocoa production, yet preserving the forest, different levels of exports on Brazilian nuts and be one of the world's largest nut export, something that really converses well with the new food trends and healthy trends. We need to really take the acai to a whole different level of uh, development. If we were able to sell flip-flops in the world uh, and conquer the world with flip-flops, Brazil, I think we should be able, if the banks put their heads together, to really provide the right finance and together with BNDES, have more of a long-term plan around good infrastructure. Infrastructure does not mean uh, highways. It means communication satellites. It means uh, availability of Wi-Fi to communities that today are not able to figure out. So answering your question, which was the initial one, for the big companies, it's working today because it's lower cost. It plays very well with their ESG agenda. Their board wants to see that happening. And investors also, from a fund perspective, also want to see their funds being portrayed and definitely being part of a worldwide solution. But I want to just bring to a lower level of practical level, which are the 25 million living in the Amazon, where we, the financial industry, need to come with better practical actions that are going to be more concrete in the next five years than what we have done so far. Okay, thank you, Sergio, for these uh, insights into the Brazilian uh, region. And I think this is also why we are there to learn about uh, this, e even though we are virtual, right? I cannot claim that we are there, at least not for me. I'm in Europe. Um, but uh, that, that is really uh, helpful. And it, it raises a little, uh, from my perspective, uh, the question whether there need to be also some policy drivers um, uh, alongside to, to this to also uh, drive it. And that would be a question uh, I have for uh, Gustavo, because you're also very familiar with, with the region and you're working together, as I've learned. Um, so Gustavo, from my perspective, do you think uh, there are uh, policy drivers being needed in order to, to make it happen and really yeah, uh, support the, the bioeconomy in the Amazonian region? Yeah, for sure, Michael. I do think that uh, policy uh, does does have a, a big role to play. And uh, I think Sergio mentioned one very important policy agenda, which is uh, a digital connection, both to uh, cables or to satellite. Having access uh, uh, at the middle of the Amazon, wherever you were, is critical for doing business and doing sustainable business even more. I had a very pleasant experience that uh, I love everyone here to share that is uh, traveling across the deep Amazon and being able to pay uh, a hostel into a pix through my phone. I was there in the middle of the forest, really like a one hour plan, and I was able to pay that by pix. It's really incredible. The potential of social economic development that this simple solution brings to the region. 
And you like to say that the most critical policies we need there is on the top, with the digital access to satellite or cab cable, and the land governance, land tenure. We call in Portuguese the regularization from the area. Once you have a digital access and you have land tenure, land governance doing properly, business happen. And those are the two main, one of the two main uh, uh, costs to operate in the region. And on top of that, but I'll say that's uh, in the middle of the of our sandwich here is uh, having proper, uh, not, not only, not only go govern policy, but uh, banks policies, corporate policies, is uh, pricing and adapting our policies, our ro roles, our goals for that region, different from what you do to Brasilia, different from what you do to Sao Paulo, or to London, or to New York. Once you accept that the roles behind the normal, normal norm on the city, they are quite, quite different. And I would say that they, almost the gravity force is different when you are in the middle of the forest. I do think that uh, we'll get there through digital connection, land governance, and uh, a self-regulation policy from the agents, accepting the value of the region and the, the rules to, 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 to operate in there are different. I do think you have a, a great future ahead to monetize and to turn this uh, biodiversity into an economic sustainable asset for Brazil and for the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Sergio. Uh, adding to, to what uh, to, uh, Gustavo to what uh, Sergio uh, just has said. Um, Sorry, Michael, course, maybe uh, if I could add. Yeah. Um, because uh, one thing that we haven't quite yet touched on on this conversation, although I know it's been touched on earlier in the in the forum, is you know the evolving development in the in the carbon markets and i think this is a huge untapped potential uh, uh for brazil and other countries in the region um and including uh, globally in asia and whatnot is the the i mean we've seen a tremendous increase in interest um by not just producers but also within the bioeconomy but it produce uh manufacturing and other industries looking to find ways to to buy credit. So, you know, on the forestry side, on the agricultural side, there's, you know, a, it's, it's a resource that Brazil in particular has that is, is not yet been monetized. And I think this will help incentivize, uh, you know, long longer term investments as we match sort of the, the producers of these carbon credits. Um, provided they're verified and not all carbon credits are created equal uh, and the market is not transparent. So, the, you know, there's still a lot that has to happen in the market for, the, for it to work uh, efficiently, uh, but to match them with, with buyers. And I think the return to the local communities, we need to find ways to, to have them also accrue some of the benefits and the monetization of these credits. Um, uh, and uh, incentive, and it's, a, it's a strong incentive though for producers using these assets and resources uh, mm -hmm. to, to give back to the community, but also you know, help their bottom line. Yeah, that's uh, definitely um, an important aspect. And uh, I've uh, recently also heard about uh, biodiversity credits, which you could think about. But uh, that's that's already probably the uh, the next step. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, carbon credits markets need to be established, and uh, I would be interested to to hear from Anna her thoughts on on this because you are also taking a little the, the global perspective, and uh, I would be interested in, in in your views on on that. Well, let me see if I can share one slide because I think what we're trying to look at is across. Okay, sorry, now you're seeing your computer. Can you see this entire sort of enabling the supply and the demand side? So what would, I mean, what Gustavo talked about um, and also what Mary was talking about, I mean, when we know that there is, from the research perspective, everything that we've been looking at in terms of how do you create the economic case for investors to move into um, nature-based solution or to foster a bio-based economy, is that there is an in, there's almost like this dance or this interplay between policy and investment. And investors are looking for policy signals so that they can make long-term investment. And we know that, you know, whether it's forestry, whether it's restoration, whether it's uh, other kind of agroforestry interventions, some of them are need long-term 
policy signal. And we would like to think that we have policy signal across the entire supply chain. So you would have policy signal on the production side, uh, which can be sort of access to feedstock to also make sure that you have like good land use and conservation practices on the ground. We would want to have and see policy signals in the technology, which is the processing side, but also on the production side. And then finally on the market side. So the example of the technology side, and some of you talked about it, right? What are the tax incentives that you have for uh, sort of in, in terms of sort of uh, policy packages on the industrial side? Um, so Brazil is a good example. In the past, Brazil has developed industrial policy packages for the eucalyptus sector and also for the other kind of agricultural policy, uh, products. And so how can you learn those lessons? Uh, but obviously with, with um, mind, uh, sort of minding all the environmental impact, you know, that we should now be able to manage better. Um, so what kind of policy you can also have in terms of um, uh, fostering different kind of R&D, right? Like Sergio said, Brazil has a lot of potential for, potential for acai, cupuaçu, for all sorts of uh, non-timber forest products, but they will need um, policy incentive for these to become commercially viable so that they can be uh, processed on a larger scale. Uh, you will also need a policy on the production side. And then finally, you need mar market signals, right? We need, from an investor perspective, what are the long-term policy signals that will say there will be future markets that will give you the cash flow certainty? So whether it's through sort of specific mandates and targets, uh, either or it's through sort of public procurement. So there are examples in the past on sort of FSB, um, requirements sort of the, the, the Dutch government requiring FSC certified timber that created the, the, the market demand. Uh, some of you talked about carbon pricing or carbon tax and then also ecosystem services. So, so I think for Brazil and also globally, for you to achieve a bio-based economy, you know, one country needs to think about the entire policy package across the entire supply chain. And there are also other kind of uh, drivers that are sort of, you know, if we think from the, uh, from the finance side, uh, what are the policy signals that you need to come, that needs to be put in place so that you're moving investors from a short-term to a long-term approach? And so that they can also, and I talked about it before, like how do you inc incorporate the beyond carbon benefits and so that it delivers sort of also the social environmental outputs? I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Anna. I think it's um, very important to understand that it's more than just one dimension uh, to take a look at, and I think that's also what uh, Sergio and um, uh, Gustavo mentioned, and also Mary. Um, Gustavo, one follow-up question to what you have shared with us before is, assuming you, you get the infrastructure topic resolved, what would be then the next thing to do in order to, to drive uh, the bioeconomy and, and uh, yeah, um, make uh, Brazil um, a big producer of nuts and, and coconut, especially. We do think, Michael, that's the, 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 the answer for, the, for the, 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 the issue is behind the entrepreneur. We should be supporting the, the entrepreneur. And it's very interesting that uh, we can think easily about entrepreneurship when you speak about uh, Bovespa in Brazil or Silicon Valley or Nasdaq, we do think about entrepreneur. But when we discuss about bioeconomy and the forest, we do think uh, or rely on something that uh, is the government only or something that's for granted. No, there's business behind that. And we do have a lot of creative people with, with very good knowledge of the, the region that they do know how to operate in a sustainable way, but they do lack capital. And that's why I do think that the first big movement on capital for the bioeconomy is through blended finance. On the past, through BNDS and through our partnerships, for many years, we tried to separate the grant money or the philanthropy money from the for-profit. And we learned that that's not, not the most effective way. Why don't you combine the grant alongside the for-profit and move the money that's given for support to a forest entrepreneur? someone that's willing to make money, willing to make sustainable uh, bioeconomy, 
and we we need to do business such as we do in the farm, such as we do in Brasilia, such as we do in São Paulo, but in a different way. So we do think that uh, sending the price signal to those entrepreneurs that know how to create that there is the right answer. Uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 there is a premium or a green premium for those things that the society and the final clients should be willing to pay, as I just mentioned. But uh, once you help, only if you, we help, the, the, the true uh, last mile entrepreneur will be able to achieve and to produce those services and to produce those resources. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting. I, I really would like to learn more about uh, uh, the, I would say, inherent uh, sustainability knowledge that is uh, residing in the Amazonian region. And um, can, can you share uh, one, one thought on this? Could it be even that these, uh, this old knowledge and traditional knowledge could have an impact on, let's say, uh, policies that have, let's say, more uh, country-specific or continent-specific character or even global character? Could you envision this? Yeah, yeah, there, there's a very simple one, and I'd, I'd say very ready to be used. A lot of people ask me, Michael, but how can I help Amazon? I'm living here in Asia or in Europe. And my very first answer is go there, visit the Amazon, and let's support the entrepreneurs that are behind the tourist or the entertainment chain in the Amazon. There are many there. They, they do need visitors, need guests, and money and financial support. And for those uh, living Brazilians, Brazilians or non-Brazilians looking at the conference, if you want to help Amazon, go there, visit the region. By doing that, you will be helping in a very quick and effective way the region. And just as an example of how BNDS is behind that, we have as of today what we think is the largest environmental concession programs of the world. We do know that Brazil is probably the one that's handling the largest infrastructure concession program. But as of today, uh, we are bringing to the market 50, uh, almost 50 units of uh, parks for, for tourist concessions. And uh, we do think that we can generate almost 1 million jobs in Brazil in the next 10 years just by concessioning parks for uh, tourist visiting, like uh, you have in Foz do Iguaçu, like you have in Lençóis Maranhenses in, uh, in, in the north, for example. So this uh, uh, green tourist or eco-tourism activity that has a huge potential in Brazil, and by concessioning those assets for the, the private initiative, we do think that we can create a more attractive uh, visiting environment for, again, Brazilians and non-Brazilians, knowing the forest, paying for being there, and preserving the forest as a very simple and, and, and effective example. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, very, very interesting. Um, Sergio, when it comes to financing uh, the, the entrepreneurs, what are currently the, the biggest uh, obstacles and how could we overcome uh, them? And how can we, for instance, also uh, attract um, international capital into the Amazonian region? Good question. First of all, I mean, you you're dealing on the bioeconomy side, you're really de dealing with thousand entrepreneurs. So one of the things we could do, and we are doing, is putting the infrastructure on the place. I mean, particularly hiring people from the region and being there with them. And we just went through different tours with more than 20 of our own employees, in the case of Santander, getting educated. You know, just really getting educated. I mean, first is the first act of humility. I mean, you know what you know, but Brazil being in most of the world, highly urbanized, we are very far from, from the real reality, which Gustavo just mentioned. So one is proximity. The second one is, uh, I think, fostering cooperatives. I think the co-ops, the co-op design can be a very useful tool to galvanize a number of smaller farmers and through them be able to provide finance, but also technical knowledge. It's not just money. It's also the technical knowledge. And the third, uh, Michael, which I think it's important, is help the world not to close itself. Because I think there's no point in helping also uh, farmers if the world is closing. And the pandemic has had a very perverse uh, effect, besides the ones we know, unfortunately, which is the disruption on supply chains, which has perhaps led countries to rethink how they source their critical inputs, which is all of a sudden, I'm going to become self-sufficient. So there is a very perverse trend in the world 
of pursuit of self-sufficiency, which I don't think it's going to help us globally at all, because at the end, interdependence is going to be unavoidable whether we like it or not. And, and that is something that I think I personally get concerned that we don't use uh, the self-sufficiency as a political weapon uh, against smaller countries or countries that are basically trying to find different ways to develop themselves, especially smaller communities. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 that's really interesting to be very close to the entrepreneur. I think it's, uh, it's somewhat easy when you are in Brazil, but um, Mary, I think you are not in Brazil, but uh, how do you approach these uh, topics? I, I could imagine this is a challenge. Yeah, but we typically approach this and we're not a local bank. Um, we're not, I mean, we do have local offices around the world, but we're not there on the ground in the Amazon. So how we typically approach this is we work with, with other financial institutions who are more local and we provide targeted financing. And we've had a lot of success in, in saying, setting up credit lines to, with, with the likes of a Santander or commercial bank that are focused on women entrepreneurs or or we work with our bigger clients to get to get them to work through their supply chains and, and you know that's potentially one of the KPIs we we use for sustainable living financing is increasing um, the number of women entrepreneurs in your supply chain um, who typically are, are more underserved it's not just women it's sort of ethnic minorities or, or have you so we typically work with and through other commercial banks in order to reach this 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 part of the market mm -hmm. that's um not sure if somebody wants uh, to comment uh, sergio you are more local i'm not sure if you work with ifc them. has been I, no mary spot on i mean i i think ifc has certainly been like the nds extraordinarily good partners multilaterals depend on others from a cap but I, I think, Mary, the challenge also, and it's not just about the Amazon. We're talking about significant rainforests throughout the world, whether it's in Vietnam, whether it's here, or it's Indonesia. Uh, I think we have a big task ahead of us in terms of the way we connect, the way how we prioritize, because there's so much before us that just defining what are the two or three things we want to tackle in the next three, four years is really incredibly important. And I just want to echo Mary's comment and Gustavo's comments on carbon. Taxonomy was mentioned by Gustavo. Without a worldwide taxonomy, this market will never be transparent, will never be liquid, and will never take off. So I think multilaterals of the, of the quality and leadership of, of that Mary represents is going to be really important to help the world to get to a taxonomy and a, in a space where definitely we can prove through carbon trading that the forests are worth more intact than destroyed. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sergio. And, and, and I think it's an important point um, to have um, kind of a global standards, like in, in finance, uh, you have it, right? But uh, we don't have it right now in sustainability, if you wish, so it's all emergent. And I would like to get Anna's view. I think she has a very good overview of what's going on in the world on, on this. How far are we progressed with, let's say, generally accepted standards when it comes to sustainability? And when, when do you expect them to be yeah, uh, coming into action uh, at a more global level in order to direct money flows and capital flows? Oh, that's a really big question. How much time do you have? I know. Um, this is why I, I think it you. depends on whether you catch me on a good day or you catch me on a bad day. Very, very and that, you know, a lot of sort of commitments, but not a lot of action. But if you catch them on a good day, and I do think that, you know, if we, we're going to, the, the road to uh, Glasgow, right? I'm, I'm heading to Glasgow in 10 days' time. And if we kind of think about the time frame that we had ahead, ahead of us, and I want to link it to climate because this is what also climate and biodiversity is what actually matters, right? If the world needs to decarbonize by mid-century, by 2050, we have some key dates. One is by 2030, we all need, as a world, the world will have to half its greenhouse gas emissions, one way or another. And then we have to achieve some kind of carbon, carbon neutrality by 2050. So the next decade really matters. And then so that links to my point about the role of finance. 
Finance is an enabler of change. And then so the question then really is how do we remove, how do we shape the incentives, uh, remove policy barriers and put in place policy incentives that will shift, that will mobilize finance so that finance can support uh, investment um, that are sort of part of this transition to low carbon economy, whether it's fair, uh, whether it's fair, it's like, you know, it needs to be fair and also low carbon and also, you know, biodiverse because it's actually not the same thing. And so I do think that looking into the space, uh, analyzing the space, I'm hopeful, especially if you look at all the net zero commitments that investors have made um, ahead of Glasgow, of, I think that's incredible. And I think the biggest challenge is what happens after Glasgow. It's around implementation, right? So how do you then translate these commitments into implementation? And that will mean sort of changes in multiple areas from what I touched uh, talked about before, like standards of reporting, but also, so for me, there are like multiple levels from existing standards that are probably doesn't capture all the things that we care about to, to, to tools that are not completely comprehensive. So I have conversations about actuaries who say that their risk models are probably not, doesn't capture all the climate risk or all the long-term risk that we care, that we should be caring about. That's a fact. So standards and tools, accounting frameworks, but I think ultimately there is something pretty fundamental that as a society, and this is my activist call to action comes in. We need to have a conversation about value, right? What is it that we value as a society and how come it's not translated into investment and, and business models and business solutions? And I think that's actually the, the deeper conversation that we need to have that somehow translate into tools and standards. So on a good day, I think, you know, there are lots of really exciting things happening uh, that are shaping investor behavior. And once they get it, it's going to move very fast. And I do think that we're there. I think the question is, can we do it in 10 years time? I want to believe that we can. And that's why that's what I'm working towards. Um, so yeah, I'll, I want to end on a positive note, especially ahead of Glasgow. Thank you, Anna. I think there couldn't be any much better remark than yours uh, as a final statement of, of our panel discussion. And uh, I would like to say uh, thank you to, to all of you. I, I know some of you have to jump. So thank you for staying some minutes longer. Much appreciated. I enjoyed pretty much the discussion. I'm, I feel a lot educated now, more educated, but there's still also enough room left to, to um, become further educated and uh, um, on, on the Amazonian region and, and what's going on there. But uh, that, that was really helpful, at least for me. So thanks uh, again to all of you and uh, yeah, stay safe, stay healthy and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference for those who stay. Thank thanks. you. I wish I wasn't thank delaying. You. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. Impression. You've brought a lot of insights. I think it was really, really a lot of food for thought. Some of you more um, optimistic than others, I think. Uh, a lot of issues were left out, like uh, uh, investing on research, for example, or how uh, recovery programs by countries could be, uh, would be used for these sort of uh, topics. But anyway, you already brought a lot, so thank you so much. And uh, thank you very, very much. Um, okay? So turning to all of you, we have good news. 30 minutes for break. Tanto pausa para café ou para mais comida. We're now going to have a coffee break or maybe a bit more food. And please be back in about 20 minutes so that we conclude today's session. Thank you.